are you all? We're doing great. Um, we are so grateful to have you. We have been such huge fans of your work. This is Riley Sheehy, for those of you who have joined. Um, and she is an illustrator, which, and if you see her work, it's like everything she does, whether it's a ribbon or paints on a bag or does some stationery, it's like a work of art. It really is truly so beautiful. And so we're so excited to have you here. And what we love to do this Well Fed at Wednesday is just hear your story. So if you'll start out, just tell us a little bit about how you got into it and what inspired you and we'll go from there. Well, thank you so much for the great introduction. Um, and thank you guys so much for having me on this. Um, and yeah, so I think that like my story, um, probably starts like around 2014. Um, I started and it was, I was on summer vacation from being an elementary school teacher. Um, and I just like started painting these like mason jars. And I had like told my mom on the phone that I was going to start selling them on Etsy. And I thought that they were going to be like the next big thing. And I was an art teacher. So I always loved art growing up, but I like just had not, um, I didn't make a lot of art on my own. And so I was making these mason jars. I listed them on Etsy and I never ever sold any mason jars, but <laughs> I did start kind of getting into other kinds of artwork. I started doing some watercolors, um, which I had always liked to do in college, but hadn't done since then. Um, and I just started, I think that like one of my friends actually at work, um, when I went back in the fall, asked me if I would paint a picture of her sister um, for like her wedding, like as a wedding gift, like a wedding portrait. And so I did that. And I think that like, just like very slowly over the course of um, three years, like it went from, I would say like, just like a couple like custom orders, like of wedding portraits or invitations or baby shower invites for um, like friends and in family and friends of, of friends. And I think that like just eventually um, it started getting out to like more people and I started sharing things on social media. And um, I think that it's harder now. I've heard like, I think that it's, it's harder to get traction with Instagram, but I feel like in 2014, it was like a little bit easier because you could use like hashtags and people would <laughs> follow along. Um, but yeah, eventually like with word of mouth and everything kind of things picked up. And it got to the point in like 2016, the fall where, um, I was working all the time. I was either at school or I was, um, at home, like each night I would get home and I would just like start working on whatever, like my art project was for a different client. Um, and same thing on weekends. And I talked to my principal and since I was an art teacher, we were able to be a little bit, bit flexible with my schedule. And I asked her if she would um, be okay with me going part-time in the spring to kind of like feel it out, like whether or not, um, whether or not that was something that like I could do. And she said that she, she was open to it. And I think that as my schedule opened up a little bit more, it gave me more time for different projects and for different clients to take on different client work. And, um, I went over kind of like the bookkeeping sheets that I had um, kept with my husband and I went over them with my parents, um, and kind of looked at the amount of money that I would need to make per month to be able to pay my bills and to be able to um, kind of like match up. It wasn't exactly match up what I was making teaching, but to make enough that like I would be able to survive. And then I also um, made sure that I had six months um, of money saved. So like my dad, I like will always go back to this. My dad said to me on the phone call when I called him and I was so worried. I like, I'm very close with my parents and I was so worried that my parents were going to be like, like, this is a bad idea. And they were both so great about it and so supportive. But my dad was like, well, you need to have six months of money saved up because first of all, like, what if like something happens with the economy, which is totally valid. And then he also said, and also, what if like you break your hand? And I was like, <laughs> and I think of it all the time now. Like I was like, dad, like that will stick with me for the rest of my life. Like as long as I have this job now, <laughs> that, like, it's like such a practical thing, but it's also like such like a, like, like, it's just like such a bummer to think about. So anyway, I saved up the six months of money so that in case I broke my hand or, or whatever happened, um, thank God that has not happened, like knock on wood. Um, 
but yeah, so I, so I went full time then in June, 2017. And, um, it was, I'm have like basically like never looked back on the decision. I think it was hundred percent the right decision for me. And yeah, anyway. <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's, uh, that's a great story. And I love how you've kind of couched it too in the practical, because I think so many of our members want to know like that practical side of like, how do I take something that I love and has and started out as a hobby into a full-time career and oftentimes like some of the advice like financial advice can be the most practical things it's like hey listen like you know if you break your hand you're going to need these savings and you're like okay I'm going to do it you know now yeah. then there's that reason to do it and it like pushes us into it and I love that your dad took the time to sit down and talk with you through that did you find like had from the very beginning even as a hobby like learning how to track your expenses and your sales was that something that came naturally to you or was that a oh uphill gosh. battle <laughs> oh my gosh absolutely not in fact um when I posted yesterday on Instagram that I was gonna be on this talk I um I already knew that my parents were both gonna like text me and my mom did but and like <laughs> remind me that when up until the age I was up like from 18 to 24, I literally would have to like, if I went to Starbucks, I would have to check my Wells Fargo app to make sure I had enough money in my account because, and if I had like $4 on my account and the coffee was like three ninety six, I would be like, okay, I can get through the next couple of days, but like, I really want, like, I, I, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy the coffee. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I will say that like, I was never good with money growing up. I never... I never really thought about the importance of savings until I went full time with this. And even when I kept it, and I think that especially like when I started off as a hobby, I did not have any sort of bookkeeping system. Um, I did not have, I really was not keeping track other than on um, the Etsy. I was selling through Etsy at that time and the Etsy portal. So other than that, um, I really wasn't keeping track of anything. As the orders started to come in, I realized that um, I was, I had gone from kind of a hobby to like making taxable income. Mm -hmm. And from a legal standpoint, I realized I was like, I'm, I'm no longer in a position where I can kind of just play dumb and just be like, like, like I now, like I need to actually keep track of this. And um, and that was before in my wildest dreams, I could have imagined I would be able to take it full time. I want to say that like in fall 2015 is when I started keeping track of everything. Um, and my now husband actually, something that has helped me a lot, and I feel like I need to mention it just because <laughs> it, because it, it comes off as cheating a little bit, but he um, was an accountant when I met him. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that was worth its weight in gold is having somebody to help me set up accounting software and to kind of like help walk me through different things. Because I, in college, I was like, I am going to take my art classes and I'm going to take my education classes. And then like, I'm going to take like a poetry class. Like I like, I was never like thinking about like, it might be good to take like a business or like a an intro to like economics like class like I was that, that was never on my mind and so I think that I came from a place of of ignorance and realized pretty quickly through this that I needed to figure it out and like that I couldn't kind of like play dumb anymore I needed to figure out <laughs> how to keep track of finances I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> it does and I mean it's it is I think about that all the time because I have a journalism major and now I'm a financial advisor for a living and it is so funny because I would have never I did not take except for statistics and economics were, which were required I did not take any finance classes in college now of course after I've decided to get down this path I've become a CFP and all of that but it, it, I do reflect on that. And now my daughter, I, I told the story on the stories the other day, but I read her texts and this, it was so sweet the other day. They were and kind of sad. 
they were like, why are we learning about sedimentary rock? Like, who's going to teach me how to balance a checkbook? Who's going to teach yeah. me this? You know, and it's a great question because that's a great question. Nobody does. She's 12. And I'm thinking from this, from a very young age, these little girls want to know about this stuff and we don't teach them. We either teach them that it's tacky or we'll talk about it later or, you know, but there is no plan for that for us. And so it makes sense. I mean, I was the same way in college, except for, unfortunately, I'm so old. I didn't have an app. So I'd go to swipe for coffee and it would be like declined. You know, yeah, I mean, it's no, just, no, was, I wish I could say that that was from college. No, this was after college. <laughs> <laughs> I was not looking at an app. And like, I think I probably like logged into my desktop and then I was like, okay, I'm going to go get coffee. That is so great. Well, I have a question for you. This yeah. is just there's a little bit. So I see Jennifer Hunt on the, on the line. So thanks for joining us. She's you, from Jennifer. She runs Dogwood Hill, which is one of our other favorite businesses. And you and Jennifer Clapp. So can you just talk about how for artists, because I see several artists on the call as well, who we work with and who are members of the Wealth Edit. How do you begin that process? Like, how did that happen for you? With Dogwood Hill, it was... So the great thing about Dogwood Hill is that they've been doing this for a long time, like before I even started working with them. And so they sent me over, they kind of like sent me over like a spiel of what they do. Um, and they sent me over a contract and the list of artists that they worked with and like, kind of like just, so with that, like it was such like a seamless, like I would say like onboarding process. I, I, I think that they found me through social media, mm -hmm. um, and Instagram and it's just like this great, I mean, they're the ideal kind of collaborative, um, I wouldn't say client because like, I would say that they're, they're the ideal situation. And it's not always like that. I think that, um, that like part of their business model is working with artists. And mm -hmm. so I didn't have to do barely any legwork other than just making the artwork because everything was kind of covered and it was like such a seamless process. It's not always like that. I think that, um, a lot of times, like if cut clients or collaborate potential collaborators, will reach out through either social media or they'll reach out through um, through email because they've seen my work someplace. And um, sometimes I would say probably like 50% of the time, like the, the client has worked with an artist before. And so they kind of have a system in place um, and they send me kind of like on their side a contract and um, kind of like their budget that they're able to work with. And then I would say about 50% of the time um, either they haven't worked with an artist before, or it's kind of like a totally new, um, new venture for them. And so on that's some place where I, I come in and I'll come in like with my contract and kind of like what, I, with what I've done in the past and, um, and give them a quote and, and do all of that. So I think that, and they can both be great. I mean, I <laughs> like this is definitely not to deter anybody who to be like, oh, since we haven't worked with an artist before, we shouldn't again. But I think that um, it's a different kind of job in that um, I have to think about all of those things as well as thinking about the creative part of making the actual artwork. Like I, it's, and that part has been very new for me. I've been making artwork my entire life. Like I love to make things and um, love to work with other people and kind of hear like their visions and stuff. But the um, sending a quote, the creating a contract, the all of that is very new. And it's and I say it's very new. And I've been doing it now full time since 2017, but it still feels very new. <laughs> So tell us what it's like. How did you begin? How did you first know you needed a contract and how did you go through that process? Um, I would say that it was, I mean, I would say that I have run into various situations over the past, like as long as I've been doing this, where something has come up and with a client with either how my artwork is used or with um, discussing terms of payment or even like things like shipping, or I would say the biggest thing probably is usage where um, I see artwork on maybe something that like I had not approved, but I also hadn't not approved, <laughs> if that makes sense. And so I think that like in those situations, um, it's 
tricky because I've realized that like, I'm, I'm really to blame for it. Like it's, I, I can't, I think it's made me realize that I can't depend on a client just to be on the same page with me, especially like when I haven't um, communicated basically like all of those things in writing. If I like, that's on me. And I think that like, I've learned from a couple of those mistakes that I need to have something written in place with two people's signatures, um, with the terms of the usage, with the, how the artwork will be delivered, um, how marketing will be like when it will launch, like all of that stuff. Like, and, and that's been, um, and it's a hard learning experience because it's very easy to, I mean, I, I've talked to other artists about this and I think that it's happened to a lot of us and I'm sure it hasn't happened to any, but to everybody, because I know that, um, some people <laughs> are probably like a little bit more business minded than like I initially was, but, um, but it is, it's kind of like you, you realize you're like, wow, I screwed up on that one. And like going forward, like I, I'm going to like do better. I have like a word document on my, on Google drive where I write like learning experiences and like when I <laughs> when I make a mistake which I do a lot I like haven't shared it with anybody and I like never will but like it's just like when I make a mistake like I'll just be like okay like what what did I, like how can I kind of take this and like use it as a lesson in the future to not do this again I don't know if that makes sense oh 100 percent that we need to, yeah I need we need to be doing that because what Lauren and I have found and I've mentioned a number of times, like building your own business is just a process of trial and error mm -hmm. over and over again. And you can't, you can't dwell on it. You know, it's one of those things that, like you said, write it down and say, what can I learn from this? And then moving forward, how can I make sure it doesn't happen again? And one of the things that I feel like it's probably one of the harder parts of that is then to like go back, like in your next encounter with a contract you're and then you really have to negotiate for yourself mm -hmm. and I you and I have talked about this a little bit earlier about how it is it's hard for us for many women to like really get in there and negotiate for those terms that you know need to be in place um how have you handled that because I know you said you talked to other artists I think that's been one of the best things for us to do is like talk to other people and yes. sort of premise of the wealth that it is that hey if we can bring everybody together and have these open and honest conversations it's easier for us to negotiate yes exactly because it makes you feel a little bit less alone and it makes I think that and I don't I think that this is part of who I am is that I'm always afraid of being pushy or difficult and so I never want to like I never want to be pushy and I never want to be difficult with people and so sometimes I'll avoid I also am not a confrontational person at all so sometimes I'll avoid conversations that I know need to be like put in place in the beginning and even things like putting like even things like sending over a contract it is will always be my least favorite thing to do because and because like I just feel like I'll like well I don't want them to think that it's it's always a personal thing right like oh I don't want them to think that I'm asking for too much or I don't want them to think that um I like wow she must think really really highly of herself because she's like asking for this amount I think that like some one of my goals is to eventually be able to I love being personal when it comes to working with people on like bringing their vision to life and I love bringing personality into that and I love bringing both of our personalities into that but as far as like things like like quoting a fee and usage and as as far as those things go the things that were written in a contract there is not nothing personal about it mm -hmm. and I think that's something that I realized also from hiring people through to like when I've hired like a photographer for my business is that sometimes if if I reach out to somebody and I ask them for a quote and it's somebody who I love their work and I love them and I follow them on Instagram and I think they're awesome. And they come back to me with a quote of what they charge. If it's not within my business budget, it's not like, I'm like, wow, like I don't like her anymore. Like it's like, it's just like, I, like, I don't on my side, like I've never once like taken anything personally. If somebody has quoted me more than like what I'm able to spend, like, or like what I have budgeted, like I've never once taken that personally. I'm always like, oh, okay. Like that's like, I totally get that. You're totally like 
good. And I think of anything, it's more like good for them for like, for charging what they're, what I like know their worth because I reached out because their work is wonderful. And so I'm trying to, and it's a daily learning. It's a daily like thing that I need to work on, but I'm trying to be more like that. If that makes any sense. We have, um, we just did a leadership retreat retreat for our team. And one of the people said, you know, clarity is kindness. Clarity is actually what we're working on this year. And I, I've thought about that so much because it is. And that kind of goes to your point of like, just explaining how you do business just helps everybody else navigate. Those who have less experience than you, you know, who maybe aren't at Jennifer Hunt's level, who like has <laughs> perfectly in place, which, you know, I could totally see that, you know, for people that are, are either just getting started or would love to work with you, but don't know how, I, you know, that's sort of how I've thought about it is it's just a good way to help them have an entry point to, to working with you. Even if it's not now, they'll at least know how you work for later, but it's yeah. so hard for yeah. us. I mean, it's hard for us to, to say what we're worth. And so how do you, how do you think through that? Like, how do you think through your, your pricing or how you charge? And that's, and I mean, that is something that like, even, and I'm getting more and more comfortable. I think that like, I'm, I will say I'm proud of myself right now that I'm like able to talk about this because I think for such a long time, I was like, oh, I can't talk about it. I think that I will like, so I have this book that's really helpful. It's like this graphic artist guild, like handbook that kind of shows like the industry prices. And sometimes I would, will say that like, it's good as a point of reference. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody told me about it last year and I ordered it and it's really good as a reference point. I don't know where they get their numbers from. A lot of them I'm like, yeah, this seems like it's in line. And sometimes I'm like, where do they come up with that? Because like that doesn't seem, but they'll have specific projects listed and then they will have um, like how much, I guess, like the industry averages for charging for that project. And sometimes it will be like, we charge, like people will charge anywhere from 200 to like $1,200. And it's like, well, that's not that helpful because <laughs> that's a pretty big range. But um. I will say that like I started with prices in 2014 and what I did is each time that like I realized that I had more work than I was able to take on, I raised my prices. And when I, when in my starting prices, especially for things like custom work, um, the nice thing about a website like Etsy is that there's a lot of um, comps out there. So if you are getting asked to make a custom wedding invitation or a custom crust, um, and you and you search custom crust on Etsy, um, it'll come up with probably like a hundred different listings for custom crust from different artists. And so I would do that and kind of look to see like, and I would kind of average it out or, and, or try and find somebody who it looked like had similar, a similar level of experience, not like similar work, but it looks like this person's been at it for like a, about as long as I have. Um, and so I kind of used some of those prices as a reference starting point, which I think was really helpful. But yes, yeah, so every couple months, like when I realized that um, I am having more projects come in that I'm able to complete in my timeline, or if I'm looking at my um, timeline and not because of anything personal, but because just because of my workload, I'm booked out for X amount of months. Um, that's when I'll go in and I'll be like, okay, it's time to raise my prices. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, something that I will always be incredibly uncomfortable with, I think, but, um, but you have to do it. And I know, um, my husband is always just like, it's supply and demand. Like, it's just like, if like you, you have more work coming to you, then you're able to complete, then you do need to raise your prices or else, um, or else you're, I mean, because if I had never raised my prices, then I would still be doing the same work that I did. For, I would never have been able to take this full time mm -hmm. in a million years. And I would still be working all the time, <laughs> which is fine. There's nothing wrong with working all the time, but I would still be a bit, but if you are working all the time, then you should, it should be able to be your full-time job. Mm -hmm. and, and so that brings up a great point. And it's also shifting gears just a little bit, but like, yeah, manage that work-life balance especially as an artist where I don't know if you go to a studio to paint are you in your home I mean it's really yeah. hard to say hey I, you know you know I, I end at three every day I mean do you find that hard I will say yes and no I 
So I like don't, I do not have a, a work life balance, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I I will say I think that it will be different um when we have children because I think that obviously like I know that like I'll want to spend like a lot more time like with my children and like with raising them and everything um but right now like I really don't have a work-life balance but I I do have flexibility and so I work pretty much all the time but that but I also have and that means that like if somebody calls me on like a Sunday afternoon there's a good chance I'm working but um but I also if it's like a Friday and it's not during like COVID times and I decide that like I want to take off the day and kind of like walk around DC I'm able to do that as well and so I think that like it's just a different kind of work life life balance, if that makes any sense. I feel like I'm working. On, I, I always think of that quote. I can't remember who said it, but they say like entrepreneurs work for themselves for like 80 hours a week so that they don't have to work 40, 40 hours for somebody else. <laughs> and yeah. I wouldn't say that's exactly accurate, but I definitely am not working 80 hours a week. I don't want to give off. That. <laughs> but I think that, um, I don't know. I think that when what you do brings you a lot of joy. It doesn't feel like work either. There are things that do feel like work. And I usually, you won't find me writing a contract on a Sunday afternoon, <laughs> but I think that like, definitely like working on a client project that I'm really excited about, like sometimes I'll just be really excited about it and I won't want to start it until Monday. So. Yeah. I went to the Southern Sea conference a couple of weeks ago and Alexa Von Tobel, they, she zoomed in and they asked her about her work-life balance. So she has lots of kids and this yeah a million things and she said that her answer was love what you do that was it and I was I because you know I feel like pursuing the wealth that it is so fun it's something that we both have a passion about yeah. it's a different kind of work than like going and sitting at your desk completing the task and then going home it's so different when you love what you do and you can tell that you all are so passionate about this because when I had I had the conversation with you. I talked, chatted with you on Monday mm -hmm. and it's just like, there's just no better feeling than talking to somebody and you just know that they are just loving what they're doing and they're in the exact right place because it's contagious. And it's like, mm -hmm. you like, I like got off the phone and I was like, wow, like maybe I, I can, maybe I could get excited about, <laughs> about, <laughs> about personal finances. <laughs> I'm like, like you, like I d did not know that it was possible for somebody to get me like excited about investing, but I was like, yeah, like I, like I'm on board with her. Like all the <laughs> exciting, Riley. <what? laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. I was like, it is exciting. Like I'm <laughs> great. We want you here, but well, we wanted to thank you so much for spending a little time with us today and we'll open it up or I'll just put in the chat for questions. If anyone has a question, just put it in the chat. For Riley. Um, but one thing that we ask all of our guests, first of all, we're so appreciative that you came with us today. And we just want to ask why you said yes. I mean, I'm sure that you get requests all the time for you to speak or, you know, share. And so why did you say yes to the wealth of it? I think that, well, first of all, I hadn't spoken with you guys yet. And when I spoke with you on Monday, I was just like, I just thought that you were just the most like lovely, joyful person. So that like, the, aside from that fact though, I think that it is so important for, for women to talk about money. And I think it's so important for us to talk about it with each other and to not feel uncomfortable about it. I'm not, I know I'm probably speaking for all women when it, but it, but I personally gr like growing up, like I didn't always feel comfortable talking about money. I felt like I might be being impolite if I talk about it. And it's, I think it's very important, especially um, as a small business owner. And I think that the more that I'm able to talk about it with other women and the more that I'm able to talk about it with other small business owners, kind of the more comfortable I get with it and the more comfortable I get with kind of um, with sending contracts and with kind of being like, yep, this is how much my work is worth. And I think that there's just so much value in that. So I just am so appreciative of what you, what you all are doing and for you having me on it here. Well, thank you for saying that. You just articulated you. the reason why we're here. And we women do learn well in community. I mean, it's just kind of where we're best. Yeah. And um, especially when we're learning something new together. And also as an entrepreneur, which you are, which a lot of us are on the call, you know, we kind of build these things and it's like being on 
it, we're all on these little islands without bridges. And then just having a place where we can just connect and be like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. I'm not the only person dealing with that. It's really fun. So thanks for being part of our, you know, bridged island today. Of course. <laughs> All right, we have one question. Um, they asked, can you talk about various income streams as an artist and how your print line maybe grew your business? That's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, yes, absolutely. I think that when it's changed a lot, when I started, um, most of my income came from custom wedding work, which I actually don't do anymore. But um, and that just shows that it's okay for your business model to change. So that's, <laughs> that's another like big lesson that I've learned. Um, but that's how it started. And then I think that, um, and that was great because I really didn't have that big of a social media audience. And most of my orders were coming from family friends or friends of family friends or friends of friends. Um, and so it kind of made sense that that's where my revenue stream was coming from. Um, and then as I kind of started to grow my audience, um, as far as like social media goes, um, I was able to start, I honestly, and I, when I say I was able to start, I would say that it seems like people were interested in prints of artwork as well. And, um, over the past couple of years, I would say that, um, my main revenue streams now come from working with um, clients and especially repeat clients and repeat collaborators like Dogwood Hill. And there's a restaurant, um, Dante, that I work with. And there's a children's clothing branch, Don Dolo. My mom says that I can only work with brands that start with D. So, <laughs> but um, I would say that that's part of it is these different collaborations and these different um, client projects. And then the other main one is, um, is print sales and um, and making artwork prints. And I will say that it's gotten a lot easier to sell prints as it seems like my audience has grown just because there are more eyes on the, the product. Um, and then we are actually launching um, wallpaper and textiles in May. Oh, and so, <laughs> so I have no idea how that's gonna go, but I'm really, really like crossing all my fingers and toes with that. Um, ends up being like kind of another scalable revenue stream. Um, but we'll see. I, I can't speak for that yet. <laughs> I don't know. If, I hope that answered the question. Oh, I have a tiny bathroom. I can't wait. It's going to be <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Um, okay. So we have another question. Do you pitch yourself to collaborative clients or do they typically come to you? I would say this is such a personality thing. And I've been asked this question before. I I do not pitch myself, um, but I think that it's just because my personality is I'm kind of, I don't, I don't know if I really come off of this, but I'm actually super shy and like very reserved in real life. So, um, but I do have friends who work in creative industries. I have a friend who um, pitched herself to a brand and basically sent like a sample project over to them. And now she works for them full time. I have another friend who um, sends her portfolio to different brands and she ends up working with them. So I think that it totally comes down to personality. And um, just because I, I've wait, waited kind of for people to approach me, it doesn't mean that that's the best way to do it. And it doesn't mean that um, that's the way that you'll find the most success. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great that's answer. Great. Thank you, Riley. We have just so enjoyed you and hope that you'll come back. We would love to have you come back and let us know how the wallpaper and print line goes. And I oh, it was so I wonderful to talk to you guys. I'm so excited to join the Wealth Edit. Yeah. Um, I was like on your website last night and talking to my friend Nan, and we were like, this is really, really cool. So I'm really excited. And thank you guys so much for having me on. Oh, of course. Thanks, thank Riley. Really. Have a great day. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.